Welcome everyone to this Federalist Society virtual event uh, this afternoon, Friday, July 2nd, 2021. We're pleased to bring you this Courthouse Steps decision webinar uh, as the Supreme Court wraps up its term. This case is called Brnovich versus Democratic National Convention. It was handed down uh, earlier today and, uh, or er earlier yesterday, sorry, um, and to close out the term. Uh, I'm Nick Marr, Assistant Director of Practice Groups here at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that expressions of opinion on our call today are those of our expert. We're very pleased to be joined this afternoon by Professor Derek Muller. He's a professor of law at the University of Iowa College of Law. Professor Muller covered this case for us for oral arguments, and he's back to cover the decision. Uh, after Professor Muller gives his remarks and covers the case, we'll be looking to you, the audience, for your questions. So please submit those via the chat or the Q&A chat function. We'll take them when we get to that portion of the call. And with that, thanks very much for being with us. Professor Muller, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to present today. You know, I feel a little bit of deja vu in the sense that it's, you know, the middle of the summer. I'm reading a lot of headlines over the last 24 hours saying the Supreme Court is putting democracy or republic, voting rights all in peril, at risk, in jeopardy. We're, we're slouching toward uh, tyranny, whatever it might be. You know, we saw similar headlines about one year ago today as the Supreme Court refused to intervene in cases involving the pandemic, changing voting rules in the middle of the pandemic. I saw the same headlines two years ago as the Supreme Court refused to intervene in partisan gerrymandering cases in Rucha versus Common Cause. And there's a long litany of other cases I could talk about. So in a way, there's a little bit of a sense of uh, doom and gloom that, that seems to always come with these cases. Um, but hopefully, I think uh, I'll present today a little bit about the circumstances giving rise to Brnovich and, and maybe why I think it's going to have relatively modest impact uh, going forward. But it does provide, I think, an important interpretation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, and I think will at least clamp down on some of the litigation that's cropped up in recent years over a number of, of fairly, as the court puts it, neutral time, place, and manner rules. Uh, so Brnovich uh, arose in 2016 when the Democratic National Committee filed uh, a lawsuit in Arizona challenging two statutes. One was a longstanding statute that had been in the books for over 50 years, um, saying that the state would not count a ballot if a voter cast a vote in the wrong precinct on election day. Uh, you mail in your ballot, no problem. Uh, you show up on election day, they'll direct you to the right precinct, but if you're in the wrong precinct, uh, they won't count your ballot. Um, this is a, it's a rule that many states have had, but some states have moved in the direction of saying, well, if you're in the wrong precinct, we'll count things like maybe your statewide offices, like U.S. Senate or President. Um, so the Democratic National Committee, again, in particular, the fact that Hillary Clinton uh, joined this lawsuit very early on, was interested in making sure that Arizona would count more of these ballots, uh, sued to challenge that, again, longstanding rule that had been on the books. The second was uh, a recently enacted statute called HB 2023, which was a statute that prohibited uh, most third parties from collecting ballots, or we call ballot harvesting, once a voter had completed the ballot. So Arizona had for some time a rule prohibiting uh, people from delivering bank ba blank ballots, third parties from delivering those things. Um, but then they said, well, we also want to provide a symmetrical rule prohibiting the collection of completed ballots. Uh, unless you're a postal worker or a, a caregiver, a household member, a family member, they, they enumerate some exceptions uh, because we're concerned about voter fraud, we're concerned about intimidation of voters and so on. Um, so the Democratic National Committee also challenged that statute as well. Um, a lot of the commentary at the time and even maybe up until the, the case and, and a little bit of the case uh, commentary that came out yesterday uh, talking about this opinion recognized this was probably some overreach thinking about these rules, these rules, uh, uh, or at least challenges to the rules. The rules affected a, a fairly slip, a small subset of people. Uh, HB 2023 had not even taken effect yet. It was challenged just weeks after it had passed the legislature and had not yet taken effect. The outer precinct policy was uh, a rule that had been getting better and better over the years. Well over 99% of voters who vote on election day were in the right precinct. Some counties had moved to alternative models that would prevent you from, that, that would allow your vote to be counted wherever you showed up in the county. More and more voters were moving to absentee voting and so on. Uh, and this wasn't a challenge brought by the Department of Justice or by a group like the NAACP. 
It's brought by the Democratic National Committee. And I think this was a circumstance where it was uh, sort of aggressive litigation that ultimately ends up in the Supreme Court. And it gets to the Supreme Court because the district court has a 10-day trial, taking evidence, looking at all of uh, the, the case, and concludes that uh, these policies did not impermissibly infringe on racial minorities' right to vote. The challenge was brought under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which has a fairly open-ended statute saying, uh, asking whether or not the political processes of a state are equally open to participation uh, on the basis of race. And you're supposed to examine the totality of the circumstances when it comes to these things. Uh, the district court looked at it after 10 days and said, uh, you know, not discriminatory. It goes to the Ninth Circuit and a panel of the Ninth Circuit says not discriminatory. Uh, and then the Ninth Circuit takes it on banc and uh, the en banc court, in an opinion written by Justice or uh, Judge uh, Willie Fletcher, uh, indicated not only did both of these statutes uh, end up having a disparate impact on racial minorities and their ability to participate in the political process, it also concluded that Arizona had enacted HB 2023 with discriminatory intent. And essentially, the bill's sponsor, who had made some racially charged statements early in the process, how infected the rest of the process in sort of a cat's paw theory, which is sometimes used in the employment context to suggest that when a supervisor acts in a way that it can be attributed to the, the, the decisions of the employer more generally, uh, to suggest that that sort of infected the entire process and therefore HB 2023 was actually enacted with discriminatory intent. So it comes up to the Supreme Court, and I think that intentional discrimination finding was the one that really caught the court's eye, uh, but also looking at these two rules, again, that I think were, were, were pretty commonplace, the kinds of things that you can see in other states and have been used in other states. So the Supreme Court is, though, trying to figure out what to do with the text of this statute, of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. You know, for, for many years, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act had principally been used for one thing. Uh, it had been used to deal with what we call vote dilution claims. That is, if there's racial minorities who have not been able to effectively elect their preferred candidate of choice, and there had been sort of a racial polarization in the political process such that minority voters' will was consistently being thwarted, the thought was we can provide some benchmarks to draw districts in a way that will prevent racial minorities' votes from being diluted amongst the population. And what's happened, especially since 1982, when Congress amended the Voting Rights Act uh, in this particular provision, is that courts in, in a, a 1986 case called Thornburg versus Jingles dealt with this sort of opportunity to look at these factors to say, uh, you know, if there's racial polarization in the voting and if there's a sufficiently cohesive block of racial minority voters, um, we're going to draw districts in a way that empowers that minority vote to be able to elect the preferred candidate of their choice. And so there's been a lot of litigation, a lot of use of these cases involving redistricting for many, many years. And it will be used, it will continue to be used in the 2020, 2021 uh, redistricting cycle up ahead. We'll, we'll continue to see Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act being used for those claims. But it wasn't really until five or 10 years ago, and really probably after the Supreme Court's 2013 decision in Shelby County versus Holder, that litigants began to look for alternative avenues for litigating claims that could affect the votes of racial minorities. And one thought was, well, what about this language in Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which is pretty open-ended? Could we use this to apply to what we call vote denial claims? That is, I don't have a voter identification uh, I, I don't have uh, the opportunity to show up at the polling place when it's open. I can't have someone collect my, my ballot for me. Uh, effectively, I'm denied the right to vote. Can we say that there are uh, some violation of the Voting Rights Act here in this statute? So these things are a very recent vintage. Ten years ago, basically nobody was litigating these things. So, so I think it's also worth thinking about the perspective about how Section 2 has been used in this mechanism when the Supreme Court decided Brnovich. And the Supreme Court, when it did issue this decision uh, on July 1st, the very last day of the term, the court split 6-3 uh, uh, um, along what people might call sort of uh, ideological lines. Uh, Justice Alito wrote the majority opinion on behalf of six justices, and Justice uh, Elena Kagan wrote uh, the dissent on behalf of three justices. Uh, and Justice Alito took that language from the statute and really emphasize that when we're looking at whether or not there is this uh, equal opportunity, we ask whether or not the political processes are equally open to everyone. 
In order to determine that, one of the things that statute says is we look at the totality of the circumstances. And the totality of the circumstances in the statute right, is, is, is a pretty open, open phrase. And the court says any circumstance could have a logical bearing on whether or not this voting practice or procedure is equally open and affords equal opportunity. And it says, well, we can't offer sort of a comprehensive list, but we'll offer five things that we'll call guideposts that we can use because any circumstance is very open-ended in the statute. Um, and we can walk through what those circumstances are, but yeah, I wanna, I wanna highlight a couple of them and maybe we can talk about more in the Q&A if people want. want. Um, but one thing is the court emphasizes that the size of the burden matters. The court emphasized that every rule of voting imposes some kind of burden, right? If, if the polls are open for 14 hours, it's more burdensome than if they were open for 14 and a half hours. It, it requires time. It requires some uh, tra travel, even if you're just going to the post uh, office or to your mailbox out the front door, it requires some sort of movement. There are always costs associated with voting. And the court looked to its 2008 decision in Crawford versus Marion County Election Board, where it upheld Indiana's voter identification law by a 6-3 vote with some fractured decisions within the court. But one of the things that, that the plurality opinion in Crawford emphasized was that sometimes there's just what we can describe as the usual burdens of voting, getting up, going out, showing up on a normal day to cast the ballot. And the court said, we need to look at the burdens and we look at those burdens, especially in the context of all of the opportunities that are out there to vote. So I think taking that language from Crawford, a 2008 case, again, in a different context, is an important caveat for the majority here and an important guidepost for the lower courts. The court highlights that mere inconvenience is not going to be enough to rise to the level of a Section 2 violation. A second thing the court does is look at the Section 2 claim as it was the Section 2 provision of the statute was amended in 1982. It says when we're looking at whether or not the political processes were equally open to participation, we should be looking at it as Congress framed that in 1982. And so what that means is we can think about the departure from the level of voting or the availability of voting that was available to people in 1982. And when you look at 1982, Pretty much everyone showed up to the polling place on election day. Absentee balloting was narrow. It was tight. It was circumscribed. There was almost no, no excuse absentee voting. Only a couple of states had it at the time. So when we think about that as the benchmark, the states have lots of opportunities and flexibility to change, uh, change and depart from those practices in 1982. And it doesn't want to sort of do too much beholden to that window, but that's an important frame of reference. And again, I think this is going to be an important touchstone going forward because today in the United States, 2021, we have dramatically more opportunities to vote. And I think anytime the state tweaks or changes, expands or contracts certain kinds of opportunities, if we're looking back to that framework of 1982, it's often going to be a challenge to meet uh, the standard to say that we, we've somehow clamped down and provided few, uh, that we don't have equal opportunity uh, under the statute. So, so the court provides some other guideposts. They look at the that, that courts are supposed to look at the disparities, smaller disparities are, are less likely. We should look at the totality of the political process and not these rules in isolation. We could look at the strength of the state's interest, including the prevention of fraud. And then when I looked at these two statutes and emphasized, look, uh, on the one hand, you know, voting out of, out of precinct voting, it affects a, a minuscule percentage of voters, right? You know, something about a, a tenth of a percent or, or uh, uh, 15 hundredths of a percent of those who participate in in-person voting, not counting the absentee voters. When we look at it uh, in terms of the racial disparities, uh, depending on the racial group, it's between 99% and 99.5% are effective in terms of the ability to count, have their votes counted. We shouldn't view that as a difference of 1% to half a percent and say that it's twice as much. Instead, the court says we should look at it from the absolute terms and the opportunity to participate in the political process. And so given how little out of precinct voting affected individuals, you should be very skeptical to think uh, that it somehow was uh, inappropriate for the state to have this rule in the books that it had for more than 50 years, right? Including the entire duration that Arizona was subject to pre-clearance under the section five of the Voting Rights Act. 
The second thing the court did is it looks at what happened with the um, ballot harvesting rule, the, the prohibition on collecting ballots, points out, listen, other states have these rules. It has a similar rule on the distribution of ballots. Um, there's only anecdotal evidence in the record indicating whether or not it has any effect on racial minorities. Uh, we can talk about the convenience of, of absentee voting, but we have this, this expansive window of opportunities to vote. And, and the court early frames this as Arizona generally makes it very easy to vote with 27 days of absentee voting, 27 days of early in-person voting, coupled with all of the decisions relating to in-person voting on election day uh, and, and the, the flexibility that some of the counties have moved to in terms of, of how precincts operate. When the court looked at all of these things, the court said, yeah, we feel pretty comfortable in saying that these two things do not have a disparate impact on racial minorities in such a way that we think the political processes are not equally open to participation. Now, the dissenting opinion by Justice Kagan you know, spends a lot of time talking about the background and history of all this, about the Voting Rights Act and voting rights in America, and really would emphasize sort of a disparate impact, looking at any kind of disparity between uh, the racial groups to suggest that, that it might rise to the level to say, no, now they're not equally open. There's some disparity. It would open far more state rules, or as the majority described in sort of neutral time, place, and manner rules, to being reviewed by the federal courts. But again, the Supreme Court is very much not an interest or interested in reviewing those things uh, and having the federal courts sort of second guess a number of these decisions. Uh, so Justice Kagan would look at it in a very different light and say that we can look at the evidence of any kind of disparity and the state's interest here maybe is not so great or it's not sufficiently articulated in the record about what its concerns of fraud are, how expensive these measures are, why can't we just accommodate them? Um, and, and so the thought is that there would be many more opportunities for federal courts to intervene and change what those state rules are. Now, there's also this finding of intentional discrimination. And it's important to note when we talk about intentional discrimination, that if there is this finding that the state engaged in intentional discrimination, there's a provision of the Voting Rights Act called Section 3, which would allow a state to be bailed in to preclearance. So what bailed in means is that the state is normally able to enact uh, election laws, voting rights laws as it sees fit. But if it's been found to have been intentionally discriminatory, a court might conclude that it needs now to seek preclearance of its laws for a period of time in the future to ensure that it's complying with court directives and not further infringing the rights of racial minorities. And so the finding of intentional discrimination is a separate and important finding that the court needed to conclude. Now, the dissenting justices, Justice Kagan drops a footnote saying, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, we don't need to talk about that. I think there probably was a reason that they needed to talk about it for the reason I just identified. Uh, but the majority says, you know, we have no problem also in concluding that the district court's record uh, indicated that there was no intentional discrimination on the part of the Arizona legislature. And as a result, that, that finding should have been given deference by the Ninth Circuit, which it wasn't. Additionally, uh, we, we can't just in, impute the sort of motives of the legislature to what one sponsor of the bill says, right? This sort of cat's paw theory uh, you know, is not going to work when it comes to the legislature. And, and the majority of the courts is frankly insulting to think otherwise. And they walk through sort of the, the debates that happen in the legislative process, how Arizona had considered similar laws in 2011 and 2013 before enacting this one in 2016, uh, and so on. And so the intentional discrimination finding, the court says, was inappropriate uh, and reversed on that claim uh, as well. And, and this part of the opinion, I'll wrap up here, is noteworthy for the reason that the Department of Justice this last week filed an action against the state of Georgia for Georgia's recently enacted election law, alleging that portions of that statute uh, were enacted, at least with intentional discrimination, with a discriminatory intent by a majority of the legislature. And, and some of the factors, you know, that, that it alleges that it was through a rushed legislative process or irregular procedures used by the legislature are the kinds of things that district courts are supposed to consider when looking at making a finding of intentional discrimination. But I think this does put the Justice Department on its toes to think that whatever the district court finds uh, is gonna be given that deference on appeal and that the, the, the findings of the district court are gonna be significant. And, and additionally, that it, it's gonna to have to show pretty sustained discrimination allegations throughout the record. And here, Justice Alito's opinion in, 
in Brnovich emphasizes that because race and party so often overlap, the, the intentions of Republicans worried about how Democrats are behaving sometimes overlap with the concerns of, of, of white legislators when it comes to how uh, black voters might be behaving or white voters and black voters because there are is some uh, you know, racial polarization in the electorate. But the court says we have to carefully parse the record to make sure that, that, that racial motivations and partisan motivations are distinct because partisan motivations are not prohibited under the Voting Rights Act, uh, unlike racial motivations, which would be prohibited. And so I think it's gonna be incumbent on the Justice Department is examining Georgia or other states to try to make those findings and distinguish racial versus partisan findings. Uh, so with that, we will we will see how the, the case proceeds. But I think what this the, the upshot of this case is that, that as I mentioned earlier, there, there's there have not been very many situations in the last ten or uh, up until ten years ago where individuals were litigating sort of time, place, manner rules, voter ID laws, precinct rules, polling hour locations and times, whatever they might be. Um, they were not litigating those under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. These are claims of relatively recent vintage. And so the Supreme Court's guidance here provides that there's still some opportunity to challenge those things in the district courts, but it's really going to be limited to those things that are the most egregious kinds of discrimination, where it's a significant disparate impact and where the opportunities to participate in the political process are really narrowed substantially for one voting group as opposed to another. But to the extent that there is a lot of voting alternatives available and the state is tweaking or adjusting or modifying certain portions of its election code, the vast majority of these statutes, at least under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, uh, will remain uh, in place and federal courts will not be uh, striking them down or limiting them under the Voting Rights Act going forward. Uh, with that, you know, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions that folks might have. Great. So it doesn't doesn't look like we have any questions now through the chat. If you do have a question, uh, please submit your question via chat, and we will get to it there. Um, well, first one, I've, I've got one, and we like to ask this of every case, just to track how things are going. So, um, one, what was the most surprising part of this decision to you, or the opinions? Um, and then, secondly, uh, how did the case, how did the result? Uh, track with your expectations coming out of oral argument, if you had any. Yeah, I think, right. I think um, uh, let's start with the second one first. After oral argument, I think there was some sense that the, that the, the justices, you know, were not going to sort of shut down section of the Voting Rights Act, um, although there was some concern about certain kinds of egregious or outlier practices. And I think you see that in the opinion here, where the sense is it's going to take substantial evidence or a substantial record to strike down one of these laws. Um, I, I think Justice Kavanaugh, near the end of oral argument, had suggested something that we should be looking at these circumstances. And when we're thinking about opportunities, here are some circumstances to be looking at. And I really do think that the majority of the court, again, in this sort of totality of the circumstances analysis, is offering those guideposts as ways to, for lower courts to be developing the record and thinking about the evidence moving forward as certain kinds of circumstances. And so there's been some criticism, uh, you know, I've seen in the last day or two on this on this opinion to say, well, you know, it's sort of this multi-factored past, and this is the kind of thing that you know conservatives have long railed against. But other place, you know, there's a statute that says totality of the circumstances, <laughs> and um, you know, I think you have to give some construction to that phrase and provide sufficient guidance for the lower courts about the kinds of circumstances that are logically related and how they're supposed to weigh that evidence. Um, so in a way, I, I think it tracks with, with some of the concerns that were raised at oral argument, and in that way is maybe not surprising. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, looking at the opinion itself and the divide, you know, the, the, the court has this term had a lot of opinions where there, you know, you could say it's unusual alliances or fractured opinions or people peeling off from the remedy and writing separately. You know, there's a brief opinion where Justices Gorsuch and Thomas have a question about whether or not there's a independent cause of action under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. But for the most part, I mean, the rest of the opinion, it's, it's a clean six justices sign on for everything in Justice Alito's majority opinion, three justices in the dissenting opinion of Justice Kagan. And at least it provides a little bit of uh, 
cleanliness and clarity for the courts moving forward. We're not trying to parse out or predict what the future is going to be. Um, and, and again, I think may, maybe some commentators were expecting far more cases that look like this, 6-3 along these kinds of ideological lines. Um, so we didn't see many of those this term. And so maybe that's what's uh, drawing some attention. Um, but I think having the, if you will, sort of the, the sharp opinions from the majority and the dissent uh, in this matter of statutory interpretation without a lot of people peeling off, I think, uh, was a little bit uh, noteworthy in my judgment. So we've got um, a couple questions uh, in the meantime. And just a reminder to the audience, submit your questions via chat and we will take them. Um, so this question says, could you compare and contrast the concept of discriminatory intent in this case and the discriminatory intent uh, that the Supreme Court found in Masterpiece Cake Shop? Are they related? If so, how? If not, why not? Yeah, I mean, so in I, I have to think back to my record in Masterpiece, right? In Masterpiece, you were dealing with kind of a, a relatively small administrative tribunal with, with uh, a record where there was avowed hostility given to uh, the, the party that was bringing the claim. And at least based on that record, the court felt like because of the size of the tribunal that was making the decision, coupled with that hostility, the court sends it back. So then you have sort of a contrast in this case where you know the, the most overt sort of racial statement came from a senator who who uh, a state uh, or I think it was a state senator who who uh, aired a video that had a racial tinge to it. But part of it is that he had just come out of an election where there was strong polarization, not only on on race but also on party Republican versus Democratic challenges. And then after that sort of initial salvo, there's a, an extensive record, including by opponents of the bill discussing sort of the merits of what it means to prohibit uh, third party collection of ballots. And I think for the majority here, at least, when they're looking at the district court's record and looking at everything the district court relied upon, they're saying that, you know, there's far more here substantively happening than to say, you know, whatever was happening in that tribunal and master masterpiece. Uh, so, again, I, you know, it's been a while since I've looked at masterpiece and the facts. Uh, but I think that was the driving concern about having a small tribunal with one of those statements pretty prominent on the record, as opposed to what the court sees here as one sort of statement or, or, or one legislator who might have had that animus, uh, or at least partially had that animus, coupled with the totality of the circumstances and the rest of the process, where it was an ordinary legislative process, where many others were debating the merits on both sides of the issue and so on. Um, so, again, it'll be interesting to see how cases like the litigation against Georgia play out to determine whether or not there's that finding of intent or the kind of evidence that they're able to muster to show discriminatory intent. Very good. So on the question of the future, we have two questions. One's court related. So we'll go to that one first. Sure. Um, what do you think about the language of um, in Alito's writing? Do you think that's going to have any effect on how the Ninth Circuit operates, given that many of their decisions have been vacated uh, this term. Well, I mean, <laughs> you, you can never say never with the Ninth Circuit, I suppose, right? I mean, I think there are some, you know, it's worth noting on the Ninth Circuit, when, when this went on bonk, um, Judge Watford, you know, joined the majority opinion on the discriminatory effect but would not join in on the discriminatory intent. And then there were a number of justices who sort of dissented from that, issuing dissents, and, and that was the kind of stuff that was highlighted by the Supreme Court. And the Ninth Circuit has had, you know, um, uh, you know, I think a checkered history <laughs> with the Supreme Court, certainly in one way it got better in recent years. Um, this year it feels like it's gotten worse, you know, it's not clear why. Um, and I think the question is going forward, you know, how many judges feel humbled by what the Supreme Court has done and want to sort of be beholden to that. One separate problem has been that the Ninth Circuit has been reluctant to go en banc to correct panel decisions. This was a different circumstance, obviously, where the en banc reversed the panel decision that the Supreme Court would have affirmed. Um, so, so it might incentivize the Ninth Circuit to think more about going en banc to review some of these things. Or it might just embolden them uh, for at least some of the judges on the Ninth Circuit who say, listen, we, we think we've got it right and the Supreme Court doesn't and they can't reverse them all. And in, in the words of one late uh, Supreme or Ninth Circuit justice, judge, uh, 
multiple slips there as I describe a ninth circuit judge. <laughs> so it's, uh, I, I guess going forward, we, we just don't know what the tenor of the ninth circuit is going to look like going forward. And it's going to be a, a sort of wait and see approach after this term about how they respond to all of these reversals. All right. And then the second future related question is about legislation. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that the Voting Rights Act will be amended in response to this decision? I mean, it's interesting. There are multiple ways to go um, here, right? Um, I think you can go with, we want to say that um, third parties should be able to collect ballots like this. Uh, and that's actually a component of HR1, right? If you're looking at the specific practices, Congress has the power to pass rules about the times, places, and manner of holding elections. And if it wants to pass rules about um, how precincts work, if it wants to pass rules about how you count votes for out of precinct ballots cast in federal elections, if it wants to pass rules about who can collect your ballot, it can do that. So HR1 has some components addressing the specifics of this case. In fact, HR1 also has things saying you can't have voter identification laws and has a whole variety of rules in it. So you can think about one tack that would say, we should have the federal government have more specific rules on some of the practices like Arizona is using that we think are inappropriate. Um, so that'd be one path forward. Another path forward is the more flexible one to say, well, we should amend the Voting Rights Act and update it in a way um, to require things like preclearance that Shelby County versus Holder effectively got rid of by saying that the pre formula for determining which states are subject to preclearance was outdated by having an updated and dynamic formula where certain kinds of things would always have to be, uh, you know, the, where if states were found to be discriminatory, they would be subject to these things. Um, you know, that has some limitations. Again, when I mentioned the out of precinct voting policy, that's not a change. That's been something Arizona's had in the books for a very long time, right? So while something like HB 2023 might need to seek preclearance in the event that Arizona were subject to this rule, uh, other rules that have long standing been on the books would not be uh, subject to that. And it would provide, you know, something like the Voting Rights Act, uh, the amendments would require nationwide preclearance for certain kinds of rules. If you're enacting a voter identification rule or whatever it might, or, or whatever some of these provisions are, you have to go to a court of the Department of Justice and ask for approval to ensure that it doesn't have a discriminatory effect. Um, and, and so th then we start to get into these questions about, well, you know, this is the stuff that Shelby County gets at. Does Congress have the authority to require those things? Does it have the authority to distinguish between states? I think the, the dynamic formula helps that. Does it have the authority to require preclearance? I mean, it can dictate a single flat rule under the times, places, and manner clause? Can it then require states to go ask the government for it? On the one hand, you might say, well, that's, that seems less intrusive to allow the states to do what they want, subject to the federal government's approval. On the flip side, as Shelby County made clear, um, preclearance is an extraordinary remedy. Uh, the framers rejected James Madison's proposal that the federal government would have a veto on state laws. And that was something that was important to the court's analysis in Shelby County. Um, so I think a separate concern is to think about the scope of the Voting Rights Act. And even if proponents get what they want, if Democrats are able to enact it or maybe to, to, to get some Republicans on board that this is something we need to worry, we, we need to think about, um, there's still lingering questions about whether or not it's as expansive as the court would allow under sort of existing constitutional doctrine. Uh, to sustain that moving forward. So I think that's going to be an open question if it chooses to do so. Uh, so multiple routes for Congress to consider uh, as a political response to this case, absolutely. Well, very interesting. Um, we don't have any questions in the queue. If you are in the audience, you'd like to ask a question here, please submit it via chat. Um, Otherwise, Professor, I'll give the floor to you if you want to offer some closing remarks. It seems like you've covered everything today. So no, sure. I mean, I think uh, again, I, I just really want to highlight that that these kinds of claims, these specific kinds of Section Two claims, are of very recent vintage. And so, what this does is it puts plaintiffs back to essentially where they were in 2013 or 2014, which is you got to seek these changes legislatively, federally, or at the state level by ballot initiative. Uh, in litigation under the state constitution, uh, under other kinds of challenges, you know, the, the, you know we, we sometimes talk about the, the freedom of association cases that sometimes are raised and are often unsuccessful in the federal courts. 
uh, whatever they might be. Um, but what this does especially is to, to, to emphasize that if states are tinkering with their election laws, if they're experimenting, if they're gonna expand and contract, if they're gonna expand here and contract in a different area and they're gonna shift around. And we're seeing a lot of that in my judgment right now after the 2020 election, um, partially in response to the pandemic, partially in response to some allegations, uh, you know, largely unfounded about fraud. Uh, and to the extent that the states are sort of tweaking things to say, we think in-person voting is better. We think in-person voting is more secure. We think we should be driving more people to in-person voting after the pandemic. Um, you know, we can look at those rules and sort of the total suite of options that voters have at their disposal. And I think the thought is moving forward that there's just going to be fewer places to litigate and challenge those things. Um, and so many, you know, while, while there's still going to be litigation, I think it's going to be much less successful moving forward in challenging a number of these state laws that are being enacted this year and, and in the years to come. Uh, but again, to emphasize, Section 2 still has a major place, to major role when it comes to redistricting, and it will continue to have a major role, role absent some new Supreme Court precedent to the contrary. Um, it will drive a significant number of redistricting decisions. It will create a number of what we describe as majority minority districts throughout the United States, both for Congress and for state legislatures. Um, and, and there will continue to be litigation about those things. But, you know, this this ruling today doesn't, uh, you know, or from Brnovich doesn't touch any of those decisions, at least at least not yet. Makes good sense. Well, I think we'll close out a bit early, let everyone uh, have an extra 20 minutes on this Friday afternoon. We want to thank uh, on behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank you, Professor Muller, very much for the benefit of your time and your valuable expertise in covering this case. I uh, did a very good job for to our audience uh, for calling in for your great questions. As always, we welcome your feedback uh, on this program and others. You can email us at info at fed-soc.org. Also check our website for announcements about upcoming Zoom events like this one. The Supreme Court term is over, uh, but we, we do have a couple others uh, still in the pipe next week. and. Uh, we'll be getting more events about all kinds of legal issues coming down uh, this summer. So please check out the website. And otherwise, until that next time, uh, for now, we are adjourned. <laughs>